Hi, I'm Ed Hume. Welcome to the Green Thumb Gardening Series. You know, gardening is America's number one leisure time activity, and we've put together some great, unusual, and unique gardening tapes. We'll discuss some of the new ideas. We'll also feature some of the old techniques to make your gardening a little bit easier, more fun, and enjoyable, too. So let's get started. Did you know there are quite a few house plants that purify the air? I'm in the greenhouse today, and these plants are among the best to do that. But you know, when we talk about the environment, we can kind of compare what these plants do inside to what the plants do outside. For example, the average size lawn, 5,000 square feet, provides enough oxygen 365 days out of the year and 24 hours a day to keep eight people alive. So when we talk about the two biggest words in our vocabulary, the environment and ecology, we're talking about the green plants here on Earth, the green plants in the house, but we're also talking about the green plants in the ocean and the streams and the lakes and the green plants in your garden, too. You know, there are three main problems that we have in the home. Since the energy crisis of the 70s, when the homes were all sealed up during that period, then we've locked in a lot of those pollutants. And three of the biggest ones are benzene, formaldehyde, and trichloroethylene. Now, remember, anytime you bring gasoline or inks or oils or paint or plastic, rubber, or even detergents and dyes into the home, you're introducing the pollutant benzene. And whenever you bring grocery bags, paper towels, wax papers, or particle board, or urea formaldehyde insulation into the home, then you're introducing formaldehyde. And if you bring in some types of inks or paints or lacquers or varnishes and adhesives, you're introducing trichloroethylene. So as what I've done today is to put together three groups of plants that help purify the air. Now, for the example, this group here is to remove the trichloroethylene from the air. And uh, first of all is this huge plant here is the bamboo palm. And I want you to notice that in these groupings I've selected different sized plants. So it's kind of the different types of plants you can uh, select depending upon your budget, the budget you have to work with, whether they be the real small ones or the great big ones. This is one that you'll see in each grouping, by the way. This does a good job of purifying the air. It's called the bamboo palm. And bamboo palm is really quite an easy plant to grow in the home, as are all the rest of the plants. You'll notice also in each group that I show you the very interesting foliage colors and textures. And I'll talk to you about that in more detail a little bit later. But in addition to the bamboo palm, here's a very nice one too. This is a Dracaena, and as we talk about Dracaenas, you'll see several different leaf styles and also variegations in the leaves. This is one uh, called Janet Craig, and it has a broader leaf than most. And look at the beautiful flowers. These are the Gerbera daisies. What a gorgeous plant to have in the home, and it does a really n great job of removing trichloroethylene uh, in the home. So, you know, in addition to beautiful foliage, you have the gorgeous flower, too. And in each group, we'll also talk about this plant. This is, of course, the beautiful peace lily, Spathophyllium. And keep in mind, in each one of these cases, not only are these plants easy to grow, but in many cases, they have flowers that provide a little additional color, too. Down here in the foreground is another variety of Dracaena. This happens to be one called Marginata. 
We very often in the home see them in much larger plant sizes than this particular grouping. But all of this group here are great plants for removing trichloroethylene from the home. You know, I talked about this subject a few years ago in a lecture that I gave. And the following year, when I went back to the same area and gave a lecture on a totally different topic, a young couple came up to me and they said, Ed, thanks for talking about uh, plants that purify the air. They said that, and these were a couple probably in their mid to late 20s, and they said, uh, we bought the plants, we bought about 15 or 20 of them, which is the number you should buy for the average size home, 1,800 square feet. And they said, it's the only thing that we added to our home, and for the first time in eight, eight years, my husband does not have a continual migraine headache. So see, you may know somebody, a friend or a neighbor or somebody maybe in your own family that's having problems, medical problems, and they may find that it's because of the pollutants in your home. And you can purify the air in the home by selecting these types of plants. Now this group is all to purify benzene from the air. And once again, you see the bamboo palm, don't you? In this particular case, a smaller plant. But again, you can use the different size plants in your home. Another one that does a very good job is this one. I have it kind of hidden here in the back, and yet it's a very simple plant to grow. Easy and beautiful plant to grow, too. It's called the snake plant, mother-in-law's tongue, or the botanical name is Sansevierius. And this one, in fact, is starting to bloom. Again, you'll see the peace lily in this grouping. Beautiful foliage. I think it's one of the easiest plants to grow and it has these gorgeous white uh, flag-like flowers. In fact, the plant is sometimes called the white flag. And look at the beautiful chrysanthemums. They are great flowering plants. In fact, if you're looking for a flowering plant to give somebody on a holiday, this might be the kind of plant that you'd want to choose. A beautiful chrysanthemum. And of course, they come in so many different sizes and and uh, different shapes, singles and doubles, and some are very small, and some, of course, are very large. And to remove the benzene, again, another nice plant in the flowering one is the Gerber once again. And again, they come in a broad range of colors, too, with very interesting foliages. And of course, these are year-round plants. And a different type of Dracaena in this particular case, look at the beautiful variegation on that. This particular plant is uh, Warnakai Dracaena, and uh, we use it uh, for purifying the air and taking the benzene out of it. And another favorite old-time plant, of course, is the English ivy, a nice texture once again. When you look over this entire grouping, don't you see a lot of color that you can introduce to the home? And at the same time, some beautiful foliage textures uh, as well. And remember, you're pur purifying the air at the same time. Let me once again repeat one thing that I think is important. For the average size home, 1,800 square feet, you need about 15 to 20 of these plants to do it. Now, maybe one of the most important sections of all, and that's the removal of formaldehyde from your home. And this is the group with a couple plants behind me. Let me first of all remind you once again, see, in all groups we've used this plant the beautiful peace lily with its gorgeous white flowers. Foliage is very attractive too. And again, the bamboo palm. See, so these kind of plants are really nice ones to use. And with a totally different foliage texture is this one. This one, of course, is the snake plant, the mother-in-law's tongue, or the botanical name is Sansevierius. And keep in mind also that these plants have a great deal of uses in the home. Again, we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail later. Look at, again, the gorgeous variegation of this one, Dracaena marginata. And in this case, I selected a smaller size plant, but this is the Janet Craig Dracaena again. Now, let's go back to the back here and take a look at a couple other plants. You'll notice the pothos. This is a very popular plant in your home. It's used extensively as a hanging plant not always uh, as a hanging basket plant, but sometimes on a bookshelf and many other places in the home. The variegation of the foliage of this plant is really outstanding. And the plant right next to it is 
a plant that we've known for many, many years is a great one for purifying the air in the home. And of course, that is the spider plant. And the green foliage one is particularly effective for removing formaldehyde from the home. Now, in discussing all of these plants, I said that I would mention earlier the use of textures in the plants. That's really important. For you see, if we look at this plant here, we see kind of a bold foliage, don't we, in that the leaf is fairly broad. On the other hand, if we look at this plant here, we see kind of a medium foliage texture in this plant. And if we look at the palm, on the other hand, we see kind of a fine foliage plant. And if we combine those three characteristics from the plants, we've included another dimension in selecting the plants for the home. The second factor then is foliage color. And you'll see here that we picked up a nice variegation from the Sansevierius. On the other hand, here's a totally different variegation in this case with the Dracaena. And then as a third one, no variegation whatsoever. So you've got three totally different foliage textures. And then maybe the next point would be flower and flower color. And that would include, of course, the chrysanthemums. And remember, they come in practically every color of the rainbow except black, don't they? So there's a wide variety of colors to choose from. And then you get the beautiful wide range of flowers, of course, from the Gerber daisies as well. And if we were to select then another flowering plant in this group, it would be, of course, the peace lily with its beautiful white flag type flowers. And in a very short period of time, of course, we'll get the additional flower from the mother-in-law's tongue plant, Sansevierius. So you see that we've used then the three basics of landscaping that we would use outside, foliage texture, foliage color, and flower color. The next point then is shape, isn't it? We've got a plant here that's very upright. In this case, we've got a plant that's more spreading, and that's what we want to look for. Maybe one that's kind of globe-shaped too, like the chrysanthemum so that we get the various shapes in the home. Also, you want to keep in mind that when you can use your plants in groupings like I have them here, then they create their own environment, don't they? And that's so nice in the home when you can do that. It, it not only provides a nice focal point in the home, but at the same time, the plants are much easier to maintain too. So we can do that with each of the groups as we go along. For example, here we've got flowering plants again in the Gerbera and in uh, the white flag or the peace lily, and we've got the various foliage colors. In fact, if we look at these three plants alone in this group, look at the different foliage textures too. So we've got a combination of all of them, and we even have the various shapes too. So you can see by combining the different plants for the different uses, then that gives you a really good idea of, of uh, how these plants can be effectively used in the landscape. And keep in mind, all, or in the home, excuse me, Keep in mind also one important thing, that I'm only talking about a few of the plants that help purify the air, and I'm talking about the three big guys, the bad guys, the trichloroethylene, the benzene, and the formaldehyde. These are the ones that we want to get out of the air as quickly as we can, and the house plants do a great job of doing that. So if you're looking for a way to purify the air in the home, these are a few of the plants you can use. I realized I talked about these plants quite quickly, so I'm going to put a list of the plants on the screen. And you can pause this tape and write them down or use the list for future reference. I also realized that in talking about the plants, it would only be fair if I discussed a little bit about the care of the individual plants in the home. And we'll do that. But first, here's that list.
Okay, now let's talk about the care of these plants. Anytime you have a plant high in the room, remember the higher you go, the hotter, the drier the air becomes, so the more care it'll take. It'll require more humidity and it'll require more watering. On the other hand, if we move this same plant down to this shelf, now all of a sudden it becomes cooler, doesn't it? So it'll require less water and less humidity and less care. Now, if we take this same plant and we put it down here on this table, because it's even lower in the room, it's going to require even less care. So if you put a plant on the floor, then that's even lower. So keep in mind that placement of plants in the home really does make a difference. Now, here's a no-no. We do not place plants above the fireplace in a home. The main reason is as soon as we light that fireplace, of course, this is going to cook, isn't it? So this is not the place ever to put a plant. You also have to be careful of the table in front of the fireplace, too. Or if you're going to put a plant on the fireplace, be sure, of course, that you take it off when the fire is uh, lit in the fireplace. Notice one other thing. In the other room, there's a heating duct. And the plant right next to that heating duct is really suffering. If you take a look at the leaves, they're really burned up. Don't put plants by heating ducts. And very often the heat will go across the room too. So check that closely because it can even burn plants clear across the room. Now here's another thing that you want to keep in consideration. The use of plants on a television set. There's a couple different reasons why we don't put them here. One is that the television set gets warm, so, and plants don't like that. The second thing is that if you water this, and any of the excess water happens to get into the any of the electrical parts, that can cause major problems. So this is really not a place for a plant. Now let's take these two plants and do something interesting with them. If we put them with some of these other plants that purify the air, what do we do? We accomplish a little landscape setting in the home, don't we? Just like we do outside. We've got some really interesting foliage textures. We have a fine foliage here. We have kind of a medium foliage here with the uh, white flag plant. And then we have a nice bold foliage down here with the pothos. So by combining the different plants and the different textures, we really create that miniature landscape setting. And at the same time, they've created their own environment. Now, that gives you an idea of how to use plants in the home. Let's go into the kitchen. I want to discuss a couple other things with you. This is not a good place to put a plant. It's a west-facing window, and west and south is full bright hot sun, and it would tend to burn the plant, regardless of what kind of plant you use. This happens to be the pothos, the golden pothos, one that we often call the philodendron. And as you know, it's a good plant for purifying the air. Now, on the other hand, if it should happen to be an east window or a north window, hey, that's all right, because the filtered light in those locations is ideal for plants. However, if it's over a sink like here, no, then those locations are no good either. The reason being is that when we turn on the hot water and the humidity rises around that plant, that cooks the plant. And that's no good. Plants do not like that kind of an environment. So over the sink is not a good place to put plants. The garden window or the greenhouse window is an excellent place to grow plants because the environment is just perfect. It creates a, an, their own environment, the plants in that kind of a situation, plus the light is just right. Particularly if there's a shading above the window as the window here because then that protects the plants from the hot full day sun. But keep in mind, this is not a place to put a plant. You'll notice that I'm using warm water to fill that for watering plants. In fact, it's a good idea if you want to leave the container of water overnight so it gains room temperature. Never water plants with cold water. Likewise, never water them with hot water. Do you know that they say 93% of all plant loss is due to improper watering? So how do you determine when a plant needs watering? You know, it's very easy. One of the things you can do is what I'm doing right here. Simply lift the pot. If it's light like this one is, it's obvious that the plant needs water. If it's heavy, then it's likewise obvious that it doesn't need water. 
So that's one good way to do it. There are many watering devices that you can use, metering devices, that will also tell you. But here's the method that I like to see you use most of all, and that is just take a simple toothpick. Take the plant, insert the toothpick in the soil, and when you pull it out, if there's still soil particles on the toothpick, then that means it's not done. Remember when mom used to bake a cake? Always she'd put the toothpick in the batter, and if she pulled the toothpick out and there were particles of the batter still on the toothpick, then the, it wasn't done, was it? Same thing here when we check for watering of plants. When we can put this in the soil and pull it out, and there's no soil particles on the toothpick, then it's time to water it again. Simple way to remember how to water plants. Another thing to keep in mind, too, is that plants will tell you when they need water because the leaves will start to wilt a little. It's not a good idea to let them go that far, but sometimes it gives you a good idea of the watering needs of plants. Now, let's suppose that this plant needs watering. We're using the room temperature water. Let's water it thorough enough that, see, some of the water comes out the bottom. So we may want to move this plant into the kitchen to do the watering and then put it back in its location unless there's a saucer underneath. And if there is a saucer underneath, of course, be sure that you empty the excess water. By allowing 10% or more of the water to go all the way through, it cleans any salts out of the soil. Another thing to remember is if this is tap water and there are fluorides or chlorine in it, then you probably, for most of these plants, should be using a drinking water, stream water, artesian well water, a rain water, something of that nature because the fluorides in most water burn the foliage of many of the house plants, and that's why we get the brown tips on them. So that's an important thing to remember. If there's only chlorine in it, by the way, you can let that settle out overnight by pouring the water early. Now here's another thing that we have to keep in mind when it comes to watering plants, and that is very often we take these plants and we set them in ceramic containers like this. Then we water the plant, and when we take it out, what do we find out? That there's water in the bottom. So that poor plant is sitting in water. If you do that, it's very important that you occasionally check this ceramic container to be certain that there's not too much water in the bottom. You know, it's as simple as that. The other thing that I think is kind of important when it comes to, to watering any of these plants, we need to allow them to dry a little bit between watering. So to keep them continually wet, then air cannot get to the roots of the plants, and consequently, they will die. It would be like you or I going out into the lake over our head. We'd suffocate, wouldn't we? The plants will do the same thing. So watch the watering closely. Usually you try to keep the newspaper dry, but I've got a good reason for dampening it today. One of the most frequent questions I am asked is, how do you take care of houseplants while you're gone on vacation? So here's a very simple idea. Just simply put in the bottom of the sink or in the bathtub, if you have lots of plants, some polyethylene or plastic. Next, take a damp newspaper and put it over the plastic. Now the reason why you do that, if you have a porcelain-like tub or sink, the newspaper might stain it. But by putting the plastic down first, then that's not a problem. The next thing that we do then is we water the plants, and I'm using about room temperature water there, and then we set them on that moist newspaper. And guess what? You can go away for about two weeks or a little bit longer, and the plants will take care of themselves. Now, it's very important that you have the curtains pulled on the kitchen sink or the bathtub so that the plants will get as much light as possible. Go away, enjoy your vacation, and when you come back, all you have to do is take your plants back out and take the newspaper and the plastic away, and you're back in business as far as the house plants are concerned again. This is really one thing I don't believe in doing, misting plants. Anytime you put cold water onto the foliage of a plant, 
in the home, which is an unnatural environment to begin with, I think you're just creating an ideal condition for any kind of disease to attack the plant. So I don't recommend it. I realize a lot of people say, oh, you should miss that plant once a week. You should miss that plant uh, once every three days. You should miss that plant every day. Or you should miss that plant three times a week. No way. I think this is just a waste of time. Why be a slave to the plant? Enjoy the plant instead. Actually, one of the best ways I know of to provide humidity for a plant is to take a glass or a decorative vase and simply place it in amongst your plants. And maybe because sometimes that doesn't look all too good, you could kind of hide it behind a few of the plants. And that's all right. That, as that evaporates, that provides humidity for the plants. That's a natural way to provide the humidity that these plants need. Now, another way to provide humidity is to take a waterproof saucer, fill it full of gravel, and then fill halfway up the gravel with the water. Now, you don't want the water to come in contact uh, with the bottom of the pot at all, because otherwise, through capillary action, it'd take up the water, wouldn't it? So all we do then is to place the plant on this waterproof saucer with gravel. And guess what? As that water evaporates again, it provides an island of humidity around the plants. And we can put several plants together again, or we can use it for a single plant if we want to as well. So I think those are the best ways to provide the humidity that house plants need in the home. And even if you have only a single plant, the glass or vase of water is my favorite way of providing humidity for your plant. Okay, let's talk a little bit about feeding plants. When do plants need to be fertilized and how much fertilizer do they need? The most important thing to keep in mind is during the winter season, plants are somewhat dormant, so that's not a good time to feed them. On the other hand, during the spring and summer, they are in growth, so it is a good idea to feed them. And it's what I've done here is to add a little bit of fertilizer to the water, the correct amount, of course, and you always follow label instructions when it comes to feeding plants. And the important thing then is to fertilize, and you do this at the same time that you would normally water the plant. So instead of watering it, you're feeding it and watering it at the same time. And I prefer to use the liquid fertilizer, but you can use whatever kind of fertilizer that you want to use. The important thing is then how often do you fertilize? Well, during the spring and the summer, probably monthly feeding is a good idea. If, however, you start to get any browning along the edge of the leaves, that may indicate that you've burnt the plant, that in other words, you're giving it too much feed. The other thing is sometimes over the top of the soil here, you'll get a white film. That indicates a salt burn. It sometimes will also show up right around the drainage holes here where they begin to get a little bit white. That means a buildup of salt and that means too much fertilizer too. So give the plants the fertilizer they need, but not too much. How can you tell whether a plant needs to be repotted or not? One of the ways, of course, is by the roots coming out the drainage hole in the bottom or sometimes the roots will come out over the surface of the soil. And that lets you know right away then that this plant does need repotting. So it's very important that we be careful when we take the plant out of the pot. You'll notice I put my fingers in there to hold the soil in place. And then I'll just tap it lightly and out comes a plant. Oh, look at the mess there. Wow. Is what we need to do then next is to kind of massage those roots and loosen them a little bit so that they can go out into the new existing soil. You know, it's as simple as that. Boy, what is what happens is they start ringing around or sometimes they go back into the root ball itself. So by loosening them, they will now go into the surrounding soil. The next thing is, is I'm going to use a clay pot here. And is what I'll do is to use a rock over the drainage hole so that the excess soil doesn't just actually uh, drain out the bottom. Put a little soil. And by the way, this is a commercial potting soil that I'm using. And it's important that it be a top quality soil. Most places where they sell plants will have really good 
soil. So, uh, you know, don't use soil from the garden unless it's sterilized. Now, I'll set this plant right in the pot on that soil that I've already put in, and kind of in the middle of the pot, and then I'll use the potting soil and place it around the edge. This is a kind of a messy job, and you probably will want to put newspaper or something down uh, first before you try to accomplish this task. Now, done a pretty good job, is what we need to do now is to firm that down so that the soil fills in around uh, the pot itself. The next thing is that we will moisten this down a bit and get it in so that the, um, we know that the soil level is correct. There's one other point here that's really important too, and that is that you'll notice that in this particular case, the ends of the leaves have been cut off. That means probably that they were brown or black at one time, is what you want to do instead. This has a natural tendency to have a point on the leaf so you want to cut a leaf uh, with a point instead. Then go to the refrigerator and get an uh, egg, crack it, and take the egg white and rub it right wherever you've made the cut. That way it seals the cut and you won't get that brown like you're getting right in this particular point. That's really very important. Repotting is easy, but it needs to be done when the plants are pot bound. It's also important to take a little bit of time to groom your plants, get some of those dead leaves out. And if there are any leaves that really don't look good, for example, that one there, we may just want to pick it off. And another point is, see, this growth is way, way too long. And it's getting very, very spindly. So let's come back a little ways on the growth. And actually, I'm going to use a uh, razor blade in this particular case. But let's cut that off because we want this plant to bush out. It should have been done earlier. In fact, you want to do that at a young age. Maybe when the growth is like so, for example, you'd go in and just take off that point so that it really doesn't show, and yet it will encourage side branching of the plant. Now, as long as I've cut this out, let's also make a few cuttings. And you'll notice one thing. I just cut below a node. A node is a point where a leaf originated earlier or where one may originate eventually. Now is what I'll do is to take that and dip it into a little bit of rooting hormone, which you can buy at any garden outlet. See, it's kind of white in color. And then I'll just strike that right in that potting mix once again. You could also, since this is such a, a, a pot that's just so sparse, is what I'll do is to take another cutting, and we'll do it from the tip end once again, just to show you quickly. We'll cut just below a node here again. Whoops, right here. I better do it there. Oops, shoot, I dropped that one. Let's do another one. Cut just below a node, and then I'll cut right back up in here. I'll dip this into the rooting hormone once again. And in this particular case, we'll put it right in the pot. And we could do that. We could do two or three and make this the most bushy, beautiful plant you've ever seen. So now we've even improved the appearance of this plant simply by doing a little pruning of it. So pinching and pruning and cleaning and grooming plants is really important. Sometimes when there's any kind of mottling of the leaves or discoloration, we think that there might be an insect problem. So it's important that you get a magnifying glass and take a look at the underside of the leaves because that's about where 90% of the insects will be. And if you find any insects on the leaves, then it's important to spray them. Use a houseplant type spray, an environmentally friendly spray, and I like to take the plants outside to actually spray them. I think that's really important. But uh, that can be a major problem. Also remember to keep your plants out of the reach of children and animals. So there, that gives you a good idea of some of the best plants that purify the air. And I hope some ideas on how to make it a little bit easier to care for those plants. So enjoy the beauty of these plants in your home and purify the air at the same time. Happy gardening.